Okay, today we're going to be learning Shabbat Af Kuf Mem Dalid. Um, today's shear, a number of sponsors. It's sponsored by Devorah Asham Weiss in memory of her beloved mother, Edith Asham Zichronal de Brachan, her 37th year at site. She loved Yiddishkeit and learning despite the limitations on her childhood education due to World War II. And by Aviva Drazen, in memory of Rabbi Joshua Schmidman, Zichrono Levachan, his 15th year at site. His ways were Darche Noam, and he led, taught, and inspired his Kila in Montreal with a love of Torah, Am Yisrael, and Eretz Yisrael. Yehi Zichro Baruch. And by Leslie Nadel, for Don Nadel, her husband, best friend, and Chavruta, to wish him a very happy birthday and many more happy and healthy years. Um, I want to just mention a few things before we start. Number one, the Seum is happening on August 9th. Um, we're going to have it by Zoom, so I hope everybody comes. It'll be at 8.30 Israel time and all that, you know, American and British and all that accordingly. Um, and we're going to have, what's going to happen, we're going to have um, a finishing of the Masechet. We'll learn the last daf together. We will have, um, actually the daf is Monday, so we'll finish on and then Sunday morning, I'll post the regular, and then in the nighttime, I'll we'll teach the daf for the following day. And Anne and Yardena from Talking Talmud are going to give um, an intro to Masechet Eruvin, and we're going to hear from four Hadram women who are learning Gemara with us, and they'll each give a, a bit of their perspective on the Masechet. So it'll be hopefully everybody will come. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is Tisha B'av. I will not be teaching Tisha B'av. It's customary not to learn on Tisha B'av, but we still have to do a daf. So I'll try to post on Wednesday, God willing, I will post on Wednesday the daf for Thursday. So you can either learn it before Tisha B'av or after Tisha B'av. Um, for details of the seam, you can keep it posted on Facebook, Instagram, or on our WhatsApp groups. If you're not yet, haven't liked our Facebook page or Instagram page, Please like it, and if you want to join one of our WhatsApp groups and you haven't yet, you can join. Um, you can join through the website. And finally, I just want to mention: I finally, it took a very long time to find someone going to America who took all the Ben Bog Bog bags. So for all the people who signed up for Circle of Friends, you can expect to get your Ben Bog Bog bags, and um, they should be in the mail. So I hope you all receive them. And anyone who hasn't yet joined the Circle of Friends for 2020, please consider joining. It's, uh, it's, if you listen on a regular basis, it's basically what it means is it's $360, it's about a dollar a day, or 100 shekel a month, and, and it's 1,200 shekels in shekels, and it helps support Hadron for all our activities. Um, so if you haven't yet joined, please consider joining. All the details are on our website. Okay, with that, we will get started on today's stuff. Um, we're gonna, we have to review a little bit of what we did yesterday because we kind of ended in the middle and I don't, can, I, I don't always remember all the details. I'm assuming not everybody else has either. So, and if you look at the sheet that I did for today, um, it'll be easier to follow the, the flow of yesterday's stuff. I kind of did the end of yesterday's stuff leading into today. What we saw first was the Mishnah, which is You can squeeze fruits in order to get juice out of them. However, there was a debate regarding what if the juice comes out on its own. Now, if juice drips out of these vegetables, of these fruits on their own, then there was this debate between the rabbis and Rabbi Yehuda. The rabbi said it's forbidden. What's his concern? We didn't really talk about this yesterday, but if they come out on their own, the concern is that if we allow you to drink that, you might come to drink to actually squeeze them, right? If you can, if you find, oh, there's lemon juice and I can drink that lemon juice, even though it came out on its own, people might come to think that you can actually squeeze it. So because of that, the rabbis say, if they come out of their own, no matter what, it's forbidden. Rabbi Yehuda said, well, it sort of depends. If you had stuff that was laying around and you intended to, forget laying around, you had fruit that was there, and you intended to use it for food, for eating, not for squeezing, then or for juicing, then anything that drips out is going to be allowed because then there's much less of a concern that you'll, you're not focusing on the liquid coming out of it. But if you had it for liquid purposes, you wanted to juice it, then anything that comes out is going to be forbidden. Then we had a bunch of different approaches about their machloket, in which case are they debating, and we ended with rabba. Rabbi said in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, in the name of Shmuel, that the rabbis agree with, that, well, let's start with Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda agrees with the rabbis in Zetim Vanavim, that even if you intended to eat them, since generally people take out, either they make olive oil or wine out of them, therefore, Rabbi Yehuda is going to agree with the rabbis in that case. And the rabbis are going to agree with Rabbi Yehuda when it comes to 
all other fruits. Okay, and then we said, well, then what's the debate between them? And we said, oh, the debate must be between the in-between, rimonim and tutim. I translated tutim as strawberries yesterday, but Emma corrected me as saying that they're actually mulberries. And, um, and people made mulberry wine, and um, that's much more logical than, than tutim, strawberries. But in any case, what do we see here? That they're in an in-between category, and that's the machloka between them, to prove that we brought a brighta. And from that brighta, we got off on a question on a very small detail in that brighta. In that brighta, it said that Rabbi Yehuda said, right, the brighta just proved that Rabbi Yehuda agrees with them about Zetim and Anavim. The one thing it didn't prove, what we're still left with, is it didn't prove about how do we know the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda about the rest of the fruits, right? It only showed there that they disagree about Rimonim and Tutim, and it showed that they agree about Zetim and Anavim, which means Rabbi Yehuda agrees with the rabbis. We didn't yet get to, which we're going to get to later today, how do we know that the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda about the rest of the fruits? But right now we're in the middle of this brighta. In the middle of the brighta, it said, Limashkin, so Rabbi Yehuda said, for mashkim, if you intended it for drinking purposes, or listam, or you didn't specify either which way, whether you wanted it for food or for drink, if you just didn't specify, how do we treat it? As if it was for liquid, okay? Mashkin. And that's going to be a sore. Well, the Gemara doesn't like that. They say, really? Stam is going to be a sore? Wouldn't you think? Right, again, stam when it comes to remon- for when it comes to uh, olives and grapes, yes, we can understand why you would think stam would be forbidden. But stam when it comes to things that generally aren't, generally are eaten and not used for their liquids. So then, why would Rabbi Yehuda say it's a sore? And they're going to bring this Mishnah from which they're going to question. So the Mishnah started off, and we got off on this total tangent. We said, what does this connect to anything? And we'll see today. So now I charted it out, the Machlok, the rabbis, and Rabbi Akiva. I want to give a little bit of background, because we were at the end of yesterday's stuff, and sometimes at the end I rush through things. So now I want to give you a little more background about this issue. This all has to do with, in order for us, anything that grows from the ground to become susceptible to impurity, it has to come in contact with one of seven liquids. Okay, it comes from the Pasuk Kiyutam Mayim Alzera. If liquids get onto, and there it said Mayim, but then they start to say, well, there's also seven, seven liquids in general, or six more besides water. And one of them is milk, and one of them is blood. The Yad Shachatam is the Rashi Tevot. I'm not going to go through all of them right now. In order for those, because it says Kiyutam Mayim Alzera, they learn that it has to be with intentionality. You needed to intend to get the water on the crop, on the whatever it is, the produce, in order for it to become susceptible to impurity. If it fell there by accident, you didn't intend it, it's not considered. But now the question and the machloka between the Chachamim and Rabbi Akiva is, do you need intentionality when it comes to the liquid coming out of its place? Meaning, if you're milking, let's say, so does the milk need to come out of the body with purpose? Okay, or even if it's not with any unique purpose. So therefore, they say, um, the rabbis say, it depends. The rabbis say, When it comes to breast milk of a mother, that doesn't matter whether she intended or not for the milk to come out, no matter what, that has significance. But But when it comes to milking an animal, the milk that comes from an animal, only if you had intention which shows that even though he doesn't think so, you have to explain, and it's not so clear why he doesn't think so, by breast milk, but he does say that ratzon and lo ratzon plays a role here. Whereas Rabbi Kiva says, It doesn't matter. That is not a factor. It's only a factor when it falls on the food. It's not a factor whether there was intention of it coming out of my body or not. That's not a factor or out of the animal's body. It doesn't make a difference. It's not relevant. Okay, and that's the debate between them. So now, they do a whole bunch of back and forth. So we started with, the rabbis made this distinction. Rabbi Akiva said, why would you make that distinction? Chalav aim is, is, you know, is only eaten by little babies. And chalav of a behemah is eaten by everybody. So wouldn't you think that we're going to be more inclusive when it comes to chalav behemah, and therefore say, even if it's shalol ratzon? And that's his first argument against him. Then it says... Well, the rabbis went back to him, and this is where we ended yesterday, and said, In tamei chalav isha shelo l'ratzon, shedam magefata yitma. What do we know about a woman? 
There's a difference between a woman and things that come out of a woman's body and things that come out of an animal's body. Not oh, right. What he's going to say is the distinction I have in breast milk is also going to be the same for blood. And that's how I know that we can make this distinction. Because when it comes to blood, and this seems to be agreed upon by everybody, dam mage fata tame yitma, chala vebeima shalol um Sorry, so dam mage fata tame. Okay, because the blood that comes from a wound of a woman is going to be cause someone to, it will be a liquid that can basically cause uh, something to become susceptible to impurity. So dam mage fata an animal though is tahor. It doesn't work that way. Only when you shecht an animal and you have intent to take the blood out of the animal, then it's going to be machshir le kabel tumah. It's going to cause something to be susceptible to impurity. But when it comes to a wound of an animal, it's not. And therefore, we're going to distinguish between the animal versus the woman. That's Chachamim's point. Amar lahen, so Rabbi Kiva says back, machmir ani bechalav mi badam. But no, I don't agree with you about this distinction because look, chalav and dam are different. You can't, you try to compare blood to the milk to the blood, just like the blood of the animal comes out and it's not going to be metame. Also, the milk, if it comes out without intention, won't be tame. But I'm going to show you that there's a distinction in the halacha between the chalav and the dam and places where dam is not going to be cause susceptibility to impurity, blood, um, milk will be. And therefore, you can't learn from blood to milk in the animal. How so? Shacholev l'refua tame. If you milk the animal for medicinal purposes, let's say, I guess there could be such a thing, I don't know this because I don't deal with milking animals, but of engorgement by animals, it makes sense, and you take out the milk just to help the animal from getting sick, then it's tamay. But hamekiz l'refua patur. But if you bloodlet the animal, you take out blood from the animal's body, again, for medicinal purposes, you would think it would be the same, and especially based on what Chachamim just established, I'm going to learn from blood to milk. But no, it says if you're mekiz lerefua, the blood is tahor. So blood is not susceptible, can't cause susceptibility and purity in certain cases. Whereas in that same exact case where you're milking for health purposes, that will be tame. So here you see, you can't learn one from the other. So the rabbis don't exactly have a response to that, but they go back to Rabbi Akiva's essential point. His point is that you don't need intent when it comes to something causing susceptibility to impurity. Because he says, it's all the same, if it falls on something, it's going to create susceptibility to impurity. So they say to him, finally, we get to something that connects to our case. If you have baskets of olives and grapes, they're going to prove my point that I'm right, come the Chachamim. And they say, you wanted to say there's no difference of ratzon and lo ratzon when a liquid comes out of something, right? Whether it comes out of the woman's body, whether it comes out of the animal, you tried to say ratzon and lo ratzon aren't relevant. And I'm going to prove to you because look, when you have these baskets of olives and grapes, the any liquids that come out of them while they're sitting in this basket, okay, Liratzon, if you wanted the liquids to come out, then, and then they fall onto something, right, or you actually, right, with intentionality, they have to fall, then they're going to be tmein. But shelo liratzon, if you didn't want the liquid to come out of them, right, juices drip out of these grapes, and you didn't want the juices to drip out of the grapes or the olives, and they did, that liquid that goes onto produce is not going to create susceptibility and purity. So now, what do you see? So the rabbis are basically saying, look, I'm right, that Ratzon and right plays a factor here, because look at this case. So now, why did we bring this? We brought this because we wanted to show, okay, who could remember? We started with Stam. Remember, Rabbi Yehuda said that Stam, if they're Stam without any intent, either which way, for, for eating or for drinking, we're going to treat it lahachmir, and we're going to say it's forbidden. The liquids that came out, even if you didn't intend them, for liquids, those fruits that were sitting there, we're going to say that they're intentional. And that's by Rimonim and Tutim, which are less likely to, to be um, used for their juices. So now the Gemara says like this, My lav liratzon dinichale, shalo liratzon bistama. Okay, now notice the word stam didn't appear here. 
there was either Ratzon or Lola Ratzon, right? There was intentional or not. You didn't want it. But now they say we're assuming that if there's Ratzon, means you wanted it, then the opposite of that is either you didn't want it or you just didn't want it, right? There's two ways of saying didn't want it. Didn't want it is could be Stam, where you didn't specify that you wanted it. So therefore, they say here, we're assuming that Stam goes into the category of lo l'ratzon, because l'ratzon means you wanted it. So Stam must be, well, you didn't say either which way whether you wanted it or not. Obviously, one could claim that you can make the argument either way. Maybe shalo l'ratzon means no, you didn't want it, and Stam would go in the other category. But we're going to start with assuming that Stam goes in the second category. If that's the case, they're going to say like this. Notice where Stam went. Stam means then you didn't intend meaning that we're going to be more lenient, right? Which means that in the case, if we take it to the case of Stam by the Rimonim and, and Tutim, what will we say? Stam means you probably didn't really want it to be for drinks, for liquids, in which case we're going to treat it like food and we're going to say it's allowed. And Rabbi Yehuda specifically said it's not allowed. So they're now going to say, Uma zetim ba'anavim. If you see these baskets of zetim and anavim, dibnei now they are really meant generally for their liquids. And yet, shelo l'ratzon velo klum, we're going to treat stam like it's lo l'ratzon and it's meaningless. It's as if you didn't want the liquid to come out. So tutim v'rimonim, tila b'nei s'chitaninu. So let's go all the more so when we have a case where they're usually not even used for their liquids. Lo kol shaken, shouldn't we say all the more so that stam should be treated like food and not drink? And it should be allowed and not, not allowed. So that's our question on Rabbi Yehuda. We're going to have two possible answers. One I already kind of mentioned, which is lo, uh, lo kol shaken, uh, sorry, lo, liratzon bistama, shalo liratzon degale date da amra lo nichali. No, you could say very simply, as I said before, stam wasn't mentioned either which way. So we could say lo liratzon means I don't want the liquids to drip out. I specifically don't want them to drip out, which means ratzon is anything else. And then Stam could be in the category of Ratzon, which would then mean Stam by Zetim and Anavim, we're going to assume you wanted the liquids to come out, which means it's going to create susceptibility to impurity, which means that we could take that to our case and say, and then you'd have to jump one jump and say, well, not only Zetim and Anavim, but even Tutim and Limonim, mulberries and, and pomegranates. Also, we would say Stam is, we're going to treat it like um, like drinks, and therefore we're going to forbid it, and that's why Rabbi Yehuda forbade stam. That's one way of reading it. Another possible answer, Ibait Ema, one could say, Shane Saleze Timba Anavi. You're comparing apples and oranges. Okay, no, no, no joke intended about the fruits, but anyway, you're comparing two different things. The case we were discussing before was where you have Zetim and Anavim in a uh, utensil. And whatever drips out, we're collecting, basically. So there's no holes or gaps or anything else. So if liquid drips out of them, you might end up coming to drink it. In our, in this case, over here with the Saleze Timananavim, we're talking about baskets. Baskets are generally wicker baskets or something like that, and they have holes. They're not solid, and therefore what generally happens to any liquids that drip out of them? They're going to drip on the floor. Which means, so there's a big difference between the liquids that come out of something that's in a bowl, let's say, or a glass, versus something that's in a basket where the, from the beginning you know that whatever drips out is just going to drip out onto the ground. And therefore, we're going to say like this. Shane sale zeitim v'anavim, the baskets of zeitim and anavim that were mentioned in this source, this Mishnah, are different. Kevandali ibud kaime. They are meant for getting rid of. And as the liquids from the beginning, you know they're going to go on the ground and be and gone. And therefore, you already in your head, you're mafkir. Mafkir means you say, oh, I don't want those liquids. So stam, if you do a stam in this case, we're going to assume that you're not intending. And therefore, the stam does go with lo l'ratzon, like we thought in the beginning. But the stam here is different from a stam in another case, because the stam in the case we were discussing the liquids are collecting in this glass and you're likely to drink them. So therefore, that's different than in this case and therefore you can't compare and therefore it doesn't question Rabbi Yehuda who said Stam is a soul. Okay, so two possible answers. Now we're back to our main thing which is Rabba said in the name of Rabbi Yehuda and the name of Shmuel, two things, remember. He said, Rabbi Yehuda agrees with the rabbis 
about Zaytim and Anavim, that if the liquids come out of them, it's going to be forbidden no matter what. That we proved. We showed from that Braita, and that's how we got off on this tangent. But now the Gemara is going to say, what about the other thing that he said? Rabbanan de Modulu Rabbi Yehuda Bishar Priyot Minalan. From where do we know that the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda about the other Perot? Where do we see? We certainly didn't see that in this Braita. This Braita brought up Zaytim and Anavim and Rimonim and Tutim, but it didn't say anything about any other fruits. So where do we know this from? Ditanya. They're going to bring a Braita. So Chatim Bipgain Ubiprishin Ubiuzradin. You can squeeze. Now we're jumping. Right. Until now, we've only been talking about what if it drips out anyway. Not that you intentionally went to, to squeeze. Here we're going to say you can actually juice plums and quinces and crab apples. Okay, but not pomegranates. Okay, you can actually squeeze these things. Now, what's the difference? The difference is that these are the sharp perot that nobody generally juices, or it's very infrequent that you would juice them, right? They probably didn't have those fancy juice machines nowadays that can juice anything, basically. But in those days, right, that wasn't the most common thing to juice them. But rimonim, you can't. And now it says, why not rimonim? They're coming to explain to us why not rimonim, and this line is going to get us in a big tangent that's going to cover most of the rest of the stuff. Okay, today we're going to have a tangent and then a tangent on a tangent. So in the house of Beit Menashe Bar Menachem, they would squeeze rimonim, now juice them. What does this mean? It means on a regular day. They generally drank pomegranate juice, even though nobody else really drinks pomegranate juice. Right? Again, this is something that nowadays is common, clearly wasn't very common in those days. But since they did it on a regular day, therefore we're going to forbid you to juice rimonim on Shabbat. Okay. Now, this proves what? Well, it proves that not only can you drink liquids that drip out of plums and quinces and crab apples, but you can even juice them. So now, if it proves that, we want to use this to prove that the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda about Shar Perot, about other fruits. Now, not that you can actually squeeze them, because that's not what they say, but that if liquids drip out of them, for sure it's going to be allowed. How do we know? Now, you'd say the reason we know this is because he even allows pr these three particular ones to juice them. Therefore, we're going to assume he allows juices that come out of them. Okay? That's the assumption. The question is, that's only if the author of this Brita is the rabbis. Maybe the author is Rabbi Yehuda, who's more lenient in general. So, that's what the Gemara asks. So, how do you know that this opinion mentioned in this Brita is Rabbanan? Dilma, Rabbi Yehuda, he. Maybe it's Rabbi Yehuda's opinion because Rabbi Yehuda is generally more lenient. So maybe this lenient opinion that you can even choose them would be Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. So first we have to say what I mentioned before, which is you also have to ask according to Rabbi Yehuda, how can you even do this? Vitavi Nami, Rabbi Yehuda. We're going to question, even if you say it's Rabbi Yehuda, it doesn't make any sense. Imar deshamale the Rabbi Yehuda yatsu me'atzman. So chatin lechatchil mishamale. When Rabbi Yehuda said what he said, he only talked about juices that dripped out on their own. He certainly didn't say that you could juice them. Therefore, Elamai lachlemeimar. So how can you possibly explain this brayta? You'd have to say kevan delav v'nei schita ninu afilu lechatchila. You'd have to say that Rabbi Yehuda even goes one step farther, and he says even though you generally don't juice, since sorry, since you generally don't juice these, therefore even lechatchila we're going to allow you to juice them on Shabbos. And therefore, once we say that it's no longer Rabbi Yehuda's per se, because now we're jumping to a different issue, which is since you never squeeze them, now we're going to allow you to squeeze them in general. And here's a bit of a jump, but it but kind of makes sense. Afilu tema rabbanan. Kevan de la afilu lechatchila. Shmamina rabbanan hi shmamina. So they say like this. The only machlok that we saw between Rabbi Yehuda and Chachamim were, the whole issue was, are we concerned that if we allow you to have the juices come out, then we're going to end up, you're going to end up juicing them, actually? So that was the issue of things that drip out on their own, and is it going to cause you to maybe make a mistake otherwise? But once, that's the thing that they were disagreeing about. 
nobody, th this issue seems to be an issue that they weren't disagreeing on, in which case we're going to assume they must agree, which is if something isn't even meant for juicing and nobody really juices them, then actually juicing them will be allowed and we'll assume that that's across the board, both of them, because we don't have any indicator that they argued about anything of the sort. It's, you can't really make up machlokot when they don't exist. What do we know? We know that they argued about things that drip out on their own. Will they cause you to squeeze the fruit or not? But in the case where nobody's squeezing this fruit, there's no reason to think that they're arguing about it. And therefore, it must be that the tana of this Mishnah is everybody. Everybody agrees. And what do you see here? It's exactly what Rabbi said. Everybody agrees, Bashar Peirot. And now we learn not only that we're not worried about it, but that you can even juice on Shabbat. And yes, what your question is, it sounds like you, according to this, again, I'm not getting halacha lamase, but it sounds like according to this, if it's something nobody juices, and uh, again, obviously, why would you be juicing it? But if you juice it, it's allowed to be juiced. Um, again, it, nowadays, this is very complicated because people juice everything. So I feel like it's very hard to come up with something that nobody juices. Because again, they say here, since in Beit Menashe, they were sochatim rimonim, you'd have to say that Someone did this once on a one-off, because as soon as it becomes something that someone does regularly, then we already learn from here a rule for everybody. That's exactly what we learn about the Rimonim. Be and that's what we're going to question in a minute. But because Beit Menashe decided that we're going to make Rimon juice on a regular basis, it became forbidden for everybody to juice Rimonim on Shabbat. But it sounds like if nobody ever juices it, and you on a one-off decided to juice it, then you'd be allowed to do that on Shabbat. That's what it seems to indicate. Um, again, I'm not telling you I didn't check it, I don't really know okay, so now they're going to quest. now they're going to first start off on this B'nai Menashe, as I said first they're just quoting that line from the bright the halacha is like them this is a little bit strange because what do you mean the halacha is like them, they weren't paskening halacha but the halacha is determined based on what they did, this is what I just said because they did this regularly that created the halacha for everybody that people can't juice pomegranates. So Amrle Rava, the Rav Nachman, Rav Rava questions Rav Nachman on this. Menashe ben Menachem Tanahu, he was a Tana, like he was an important person that we're going to rule halacha based on him. The Chitema halacha, and if you do want to say that we pass in halacha based on him, Ki Aitana de Savala Kishal Menachem Menashe bar Menachem, it's halacha, sorry, the Chitema halacha Kitana. And that's, it's not because he was a Tana, but it's because of the Tana who brought him the Halacha. Mishum, this is still, I'm going to question you. Mishum, this Savar, ke Menashe bar Menachem, Halacha ke Moto, Menashe bar Menachem, Habe Ruba da Alma. You're going to rule something based on this unique individual and what he did in his house. He was not most of the world, right? He was one, one guy who did this. How are we ruling based on one person? So this is a big question that's going to take us for the next little section. And then from there, we're going to get off on a separate tangent. So the Gemara says, in, yes, in fact, I'll show you an example of where Rav Nachman answers him. I'll show you an example of where we rule based on one, well, problem is, I can't say one individual, but based on unique, unique users or unique people. Okay, what is this? Ditna. Okay, now we're moving into the issue of kilaim. You're not allowed to plant... Um, to plant when, you know, seeds of grains, let's say, where you have a vineyard, right? That's called kilea karen. You can't plant very close to them, close to each other. Now the Mishnah talks about hamakayem kotsim bekerem. Let's say you have thorn bushes that grew and you leave them in your karen. Are you going to be, is this forbidden mishum kilea karen or not? So Rabbi Lezer Omer Kidesh. This is a problem. Kidesh comes from the word in the Pasuk there um, about Kilea Kerem. It's a problem. Chachamim omrim eno makadesh ela davar shekamo mekaimim. Generally, people do not keep thorn bushes. And therefore, if you kept your thorn bush, it doesn't matter. We're going to go by something that generally people leave there. But since most people cut away their thorn bushes, therefore, even if you leave yours, we're not going to obligate you. Va'am Rabbi Chanina, my time at Rabbi Leezer, why does Rabbi Lezer say that if you leave it in your in your kerem, it's going to be a problem of kilea kerem? He says shekem ba'aravia in Arabia mekaimim kotzei sadot ligmalehem. They keep them there for their 
for their um, camels. So because of that, because of the people in Arabia, we're ruling for everybody. So if you living somewhere else, leave your thorn bush there, we're basically going to say that this creates a problem of Kilea Karim because even though most people get rid of them, there are people who keep them there and we're going to rule based on a minority. Okay? Based on the minority, we're going to rule. So the Gemara says, you can't compare the minority of Arabia to the minority of Menachem be, um, of Menashe be Menachem. Midi Iria, you're going to compare those two? De Aravia Atra. Hacha Batvat Ato, it's a kol adam. Aravia is a whole area, it's a whole area, a city or region where people live. That's a lot of people. We can judge something based on that. But here you're talking about one individual. It doesn't make any sense. So they say, okay, the reason we hold like, that's, that's not a good answer to explain why we hold like Menashe Bar Menachem, but we're going to prove it from here, a different case. As Rav Chista said, Rav Chista, tradin If you squeeze beets, now generally you don't squeeze beets, although I guess there is beet juice, I don't know, does anyone drink beet juice? I guess people, right, there's borscht, people cook it up, but you generally don't squeeze it. So if you squeeze beets, vinatanam be mikveh, and you pour it into a mikveh, okay, not necessarily the brightest thing to do, but you pour it into your mikveh, poslimit mikveh b'shinoi mareh. Depending on how much water is in the mikveh, this beet juice, right, we, we all know, I, I, anytime I touch beets, right, I get red all over my fingers. So you can understand why the beet juice, right, at a certain point, with a certain amount of it, will change the color of the mikveh. So when it, the color Right, when the color of the mikveh changes, that's when the mikveh is pasul. It's no longer a good mikveh. Now, what does that mean? According to Rav Chista, this shows that beet juice is considered a liquid, even though nobody squeezes beet juice generally, but we're going to call it a liquid anyway. Right? Imagine this is like saying, if I squeeze some, you know, um, I don't know, when I was little, and now carrot juice is so popular, but people generally didn't eat carrot juice didn't drink it. And the thought of calling carrot juice juice, right? It's not, it's not something people generally drink. Now it's very common, but let's take something that nobody really drinks, right? So the liquid that comes out of beets, would you call it beet juice? Is it a drink? Or is it not really a drink? Because nobody, nobody makes that kind of thing. So what he's saying is the fact that apostles the mikvah, b'shinoi mar'e, shows what can apostle a mikvah, a liquid that falls into the mikvah. So this means that it's a liquid, the fact that it's a liquid then comes to teach us, likewise, the rimonim, a beit menashia, that's going to be a liquid, even if generally people don't do it. Here you have another example of where generally people don't do it, and yet we call it a liquid because it can mess up your mikvah. Think about it. If it's not a liquid, it's not going to mess up your mikvah. Although we're going to see that maybe there's an approach that that's not the case. But the assumption of Christi is only if it's a liquid is it going to mess up your mikvah, b'shinu imar'eh. So they say, So how can you explain this? If they're, oh, sorry, I think I skipped those words. Nobody really juices these. And yet, so how can you explain this? Since you thought it was important, because you squeezed it, somebody made beet juice. So even though no one else drinks this, you made it important. Therefore, you can mess up this mikvah with it. You've, create, you've turned it into a mashke, basically. So hachanami, likewise with the pomegranates, kevan da'achshavinu, since Menashe bar Menachem thought this was important and wanted to make juice out of it, havaluhu mashke, becomes a drink. It's called a drink even if nobody else really drinks this. So that's Rav Chista, and that answers our question. So we started with, again, I want to keep clear on the structure because we're going to get right off of it in a minute. We started with the question, in this section anyway, we had this b'rita, where it quoted Beit Menashe, we quoted it before to show how we know the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda about Shar Perot. Now we're off in a tangent about the Rimonim and the Beit Menashe. How do we judge something based on, how do we make a ruling based on what one person does? Well, either we bring this other proof from Arabia, but they say we don't like that because most people, you know, that's a whole region, that's different than one unique individual. So then they learn it from this mikvah case. The fact that it's Posa B'Shino Imaras shows you thought it was important, and therefore it's considered a liquid that can now mess up your mikvah. Likewise here, we're going to call it a liquid, which means that, again, you can't squeeze it on Shabbat, can't juice it. Rav Papa, now we're getting off from our topic, Rav Papa is going to disagree with Rav Chista's understanding of this mikvah pasling case. 
he's going to think it's not because we view it as a liquid, which then basically means that Rav Papa doesn't really have a good answer to Bar Menashe, but that's not going to, that's not a concern of the Gemara right now. Rav Papa is going to say, I have a different way of looking at this mikvah case. Rav Papa Amar, Mishum dahave davar she'en osimi menu mikvah lechatchila. V'chol davar she'en osimi menu mikvah lechatchila posel et ha-mikvah b'shino imare. It's not because it's a liquid. It has nothing to do, we don't call this a mashke. It's just that you can't make a mikvah out of beet juice. And anything that you can't make a mikvah out of, if you pour it into the mikvah, it's going to mess up the mikvah if it changes the color of the mikvah. So he says it has nothing to do with what's called a liquid, what's not called a liquid. He has a different approach to it. Now we're going to bring another, uh, we're going to bring a different source and we're going to, about the mikvah. And we're going to show that the machlok at Rav Chistan, Rav Papa, again, is something considered a liquid. And is that, because it's a liquid, that's why it messes up your mikvah? Or is it just because it can't be a mikvah itself and that's why it messes up the mikvah? That machlok between Rav Chistan and Rav Papa about the mikvah case is also machlok that Abai and Rav have on the following Mishnah. Tanan Hatan, there's a Mishnah that says, Nafal tocho, if into your mikvah falls, Yayin, wine, ochometz, or vinegar, or mochal. Okay, what is mochal? Mochal is the um, the liquid that seeps out of the olives. Not the oil, but there's some liquid. So the liquid that seeps out of the olives is called the mochal. If you have mochal, vishino, right, those things all fall into the mikvah. Vishina marav, and it changed the color of the mikvah, pasul. Then the mikvah is pasu. So now, the Gemara says, Man tana de mochal mashkehu. Who's the tana who holds that mochal is a mashkeh? Because the Gemara right now assumes, like Rav Chista did earlier, that in order for something to mess up a mikvah, it has to be a liquid. So who, they say, right, yayin, okay, that's a liquid, wine. Chometz, vinegar, that's clearly a liquid. But mochal, who calls this a liquid, right? It's it's little droplets that come out of the olives. That's not a liquid. So they say, who's the Tana who thinks this is a liquid? So now the running assumption of this is, in order to pass on the mikvah, it has to be a liquid. That's what Rav Chista held. And Rabbi is going to hold the same thing because he's going to bring a Tana that shows that Mochal is a liquid. So I'm Rabbi. Rabbi Yaakov, I'm Rabbi Yaakov. It's Rabbi Yaakov. How do we know? Detanya, as it says in the following Brayta, Rabbi Yaakov Omer, Mochal hareu kimashke. Uma, so it's a liquid. So if it's a liquid, though, we're going to have a separate problem. But why do they say that the mocha that comes out in the beginning, right, the first stage is you put the olives in a pile, and there's some liquid that, that, that um, seeps out of them. That mocha is not going to be susceptible to impurity, meaning it won't, it's not a liquid that if it falls on something, it will create susceptibility to impurity. Why not? Um, he says that one is not going to be Lafisha ain't over because you don't want this liquid coming out right now. Generally, what's the issue? When the liquid comes out at the same time that the oil is seeping out of it, well, then the liquid will mix up with the oil and it's good for the oil, right? Like it'll mix in with it. But if it just drips out like this, it's not of any significance. So therefore, he says what's clear to him is that the early stages, this mochal is not a liquid it's not going to create susceptibility to impurity. But as soon as you really start getting the oil dripping out at a later stage, then it will already be considered a liquid. And there you have it, that according to Rabbi Yaakov, it's considered a liquid. Okay? Mocha. And that's what we have. It's a liquid. And that's how we show that Abai said, that's why it messes up your mikvah, because it's a liquid. And that matches Rav Chista from before. Rabbi Shimon, we're continuing along in this Brayta because we quoted it already, and now we'll a little bit explain this whole part before we get back to our topic. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Mochal eno kimashke. It's not a liquid. Umatam amru mochal eyotse mi ikube tabad tamei, lefi she'i afshar lo belo tzichtzuchei shemen. He says the mochal is not a liquid. Okay? He doesn't think it is. Why then is it mitame when it comes out of the ikube tabad, which is once you put the beam in the olive press, you put a beam on it to get all the juices, all the oil out, because the mochal itself at that stage can't be on its own. It's always going to be mixed up with oil. If it's going to be mixed up with oil, well then, it obvious, you know, it's, the mochal itself is a mashke because it's, it's, sorry, it's not a mashke by itself, but at that stage, 
If it falls on something, it's going to cause susceptibility to impurity. And why is that? It's because it has to be that it's mixed up with oil. There's no way that you could get just the liquid out and it wouldn't come with any oil in it. So therefore, when it falls on something, we basically call that oil. It's olive oil. It's not liquid that comes off of it because it must be it's mixed in with some of that stuff. So now they say my benayu. So again, we're a little bit off on a tangent right now which is, what's the difference between them? Because also, both of them think that the mohal is going to create susceptibility and purity at a later stage, not in an earlier stage. So, What if, after the olives are done with the ikul tabad, they're sitting there a number of days later, and some liquid drips out of them? So, according to Rabbi Yaakov, that's still going to be a liquid. Because at that stage... Already you want liquids to come out because anything that really comes out will end up getting mixed up with the oil. But according to Rabbi Shimon, that liquid might drip out independently from the oil because you're not exactly dripping all the oil out at this point. Only little things come out here and there and it might not necessarily be, be with oil on it. And therefore it won't create susceptibility to impurity. And that's the difference between them. Okay, now getting back to our topic. So we wanted to show that Abai and Rav disagree about the exact same thing that Rav Chister and Rav Papa disagree about, with it, which is, why is something that's not generally considered a liquid, can it be considered a liquid for messing up the mikvah? Or does it mess up the mikvah with Shino Imara, not because it's a liquid, but for some other reason, right? So again, Rav Chister thought the beet juice, and Abai thought the mochal, the liquid that comes out of the olive, are considered liquids, and that's why they mess up a shino imara. But Rav Papa said, no, it's just because it's something that you can't make a mikvah from. Rav says the same thing. Rav Amar Mishum Dabi Davar She'en Osimei Menu Mikvah Uposel Ta Mikvah B'Shino Imal Eh. He says it's because you can't make a mikvah out of mochal, and that's why it's not. It's going to mess it up a shino imara because it's just something you can't make a mikvah out of. Okay, finished topic. That was a big long tangent we got off of, all of because of the Beit Menashe and. And what they did there, now we're back to our topic of squeezing. So now we're going to mention something else, which I mentioned yesterday, and here we see it inside. Amar of Yudah Mar Shmuel. Sochet adam eshkoshal anavim litochak deira, ava lo litochak keara. You can put it into a, a pot with, some, with food in it. Now you can put it on food. You can't put it in a bowl with liquids. Okay? Can't go with liquids. It can go with solids. So now they say, Amar of Chista, midivre rabbeinu nilmad. From, from what he just said, we can derive. Okay, we talked about this once before, about milking. When you milk, if you take the milk, you can put it letochak dera, but not letochak keara. You can put it, if you want to take the milk out, you can't collect it as milk, as a liquid. Why? What's milking have to do with this? Because milking is dash. It's the same, it's mefarek. You're Chayav and milking mishum mefarek. This actually debates about exactly what this, what mefarek is, but it, what are you doing, right? Most of the opinions say it's just like schita. You're taking out something when it's held inside something else, right? It's like separating the wheat from the chaff. So you can cholev ez letochak dera, but not letochak keara. Alma kasavar, he must hold that mashkeh habala ochel ochel hu. That a liquid that goes onto food is called food and not liquid. This is the way we would say it, solids, liquids. If you pour a liquid onto solids, it's considered solid at this point. It's not considered a liquid, that's why it's allowed. As I mentioned, you can squeeze your lemon onto salad, but you can't squeeze it into a cup of tea. So now he says, but if that's the case, so now we're going to say, okay, so he assumes that must be what he's saying. Mativ Rami Barhama, he brings a question on this. Zav shecholevet ha'ez. If a zav milks a, a goat, hachalav tame, okay? A zav, remember, carries impurity. He's going to, when he, you no, know, he doesn't actually touch the chalav itself, touches the udders of the animal, but this is what we call tumat hasit. He causes the milk to come out. Because of that, he had effect on the milk, and the milk is tame. So now they say, wait a minute. Now the assumption is, it doesn't matter, okay, this is an important point they don't mention, it seems to not make a difference whether the milk is going onto something solid or the milk is going onto something liquid, either which way he's going to be metame. We're now out of Shabbat, but it's the same concepts always. We always compare Tumah to Shabbat, that 
what's going to happen by, is it a drink, is it a liquid for tuma, and therefore is it a liquid, right, remember, liquids are significant for tuma because they, they create susceptibility to impurity. So now, if it's a liquid for tuma, so now they say like this, if we're going to say this is like a solid, then be my eat kasher. What's the problem? In order, when you have a crop growing, if it's attached to the ground, it's not susceptible to impurity. When you detach it, then it has to come in contact with a liquid, and then it can be susceptible to impurity. Here, you have something inside. It's not susceptible to impurity when it's inside. When it comes out, what do we say? Well, the zav caused it to come out. The zav affected it. It made it tame. But if we say that if it falls on a solid, it's considered a solid. Well, there's no liquid that ever came in contact with that milk. So it never became susceptible to impurity. So how could you say that that milk becomes impure? It never came in contact with another liquid because that liquid basically turned into a solid and never was in contact with another liquid. So how could that be? So would they answer, as Rabbi Yochanan answers somewhere else, Kedam Rabbi Yochanan, B'tipah Meluchlechet, it's al piyadad. It's what happens is when you milk animals, generally some of the milk comes out and stays on the udders. So there must have been a little bit of a dirty um, droplet on the udders from before. Therefore, that drop came in contact with the milk as it came out and created the susceptibility and impurity. And therefore, when it comes out, as it's coming out, it's already touching what creates the susceptibility to impurity, that little bit that was left on the udder from before. So like he answered that in some other case, Hachanami, he'll answer that here too. And that's why, that's how it's, he's able to be Mitami. Okay, why did we ask this? Again, because here it doesn't seem to distinguish whether it fell on a liquid or whether it fell on a solid. Therefore, even if it fell on a solid, and from that we get to this question about if it fell on a solid and becomes solid, where does it ever become susceptible to impurity? And the answer is from this Dipam Luchlechet al Piyadad. Okay, we're going to continue tomorrow with more questions on this, on what we said. Um, we'll pick up here tomorrow. Have a good day. Um, and as I said, we'll be teaching tomorrow morning as regular and not on Thursday. And I'll just post the Wednesday, the Thursday DAF sometime Wednesday.